um, three prolific and experienced and interesting and dynamic um, speakers who are going to be talking to us about genre communities. And I'm guessing we're going to venture into online, maybe conventions, um, what genre communities are and how, how we can engage with them as writers, how we can use them to market our books, how they can um, inspire us by meeting, meeting people who are just obsessed with the same things we're obsessed with. Um, so I'll probably throw it open in a minute and we're just going to have a discussion and then I will have questions at the end. So I'm going to start with Sean Williams, who most of you probably know. Um, Sean is the hardest working writer that I know. He works constantly. So he's written more than 30 novels. It's way more. It's like 30, 38. 38. Wow. And 75 plus short stories. Three <laughs> Carlos Sitmar Awards. He's been nominated for the Philip Dick Award. And in 2008, he won the Peter McNamara Award for contributions to Australia. What did Until I was trying to be um, Australia, if, you, if you're not aware that Australia has national science fiction conventions and a very strong sense of fandom in science fiction and fantasy, when you're as famous as story culture in Australia, go and pick up my prize. And I didn't really want to because I had a social phobia and I'd never been to a convention before. But I, I went in for an hour and a half to accept my check, to hear half of a Neil Gaiman reading and then ran away because I was a bit scared. But later on when I got over my social phobia I started going to conventions because it seemed like a great way to meet other writers and other people interested in doing what I was doing and um, I've never looked back. Awesome. So next to Sean is Isabel Carmody, who you'd also <laughs> know. Very prolific as well. Um, so you'd all probably know the Over Newton Chronicles. <laughs> which the latest book is coming out this year, I believe. Is it out or not? <laughs> Next year. Next year. <laughs> 2014, The Red Queen will be out. Um, she's won multiple awards as well, such as the CBC Book of the Year, the Children's Literature Peace Prize, and a Gold Aurealis Award, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, Isabel, what about you? What was your first introduction? To genre communities? Um, well... I, didn't, I was 14 when I wrote my first book, so I didn't even, I was friendless. I didn't even have a community, let alone a, you know, a community of people who wrote. And when I was growing up, we didn't meet authors, so I just thought they were shining dead beings on another planet or something. It never occurred to me you could write to them, let alone meet them. And I wasn't writing to be published because I couldn't have imagined being published. It wasn't that I thought, oh, I can't do that. I, it didn't even come into my head. So the thought of community was the last thing in my mind. Um, when I was writing to begin with. But later on in my career, um, again, I wasn't writing... There wasn't a category called fantasy when I started to write, but when there was a category called fantasy, everyone assumes you're writing to the category, which, again, I don't do, and I don't think most people write to a category. So it wasn't until I was, like, 40 or something, someone said, did you know there's a convention somewhere... Or I was asked to speak at one... Yeah, I was asked to speak at one in Canberra, mm. a convention, and I thought, well, convention of what? And so I went, <laughs> and I was astounded, as Sean said, I was astounded, not only at how many writers were there, how many interesting people were there, and I just, this is it, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. So I've been to a couple of world conventions, um, um, world science fiction, world fantasy conventions since, and they're so huge that I didn't have a social phobia, but I developed one after going to the <laughs> And I was totally freaked out. Like, this at Atlanta, there's like 7,000 people. I was just horrified. And then <laughs> the, the first gig I was ever given at a convention was, was to read at 7 o'clock in the morning after at the biggest party of... And I thought, no one's going to come. Nobody knows who I am. So I went into this room all alone. So it can be a lonely thing at convention too if you don't know what you're doing and where you're going. It is a great place to go, I think, to find like-minded people. So that was it for me. And last on our panel is Dan McGuinness, who um, does multiple things. So Dan has got... We used to make feature films. He was a skater boy. He now has a clothing label called Miasma, which will be out in stores soon, if you want to look for that. Um, and he writes children's fiction. So Pilot and Huxley. Has anyone heard of Pilot and Huxley? Um, which has recently been optioned to be a cartoon in the US um, and he writes children's books and does some amazing workshops at schools as well. Mm. So I was wondering, Dan, <coughs> what your experience is because, oh, I forgot to mention, he also works at Pulp Fiction Comics, so he's got a lot of experience with <coughs> fanboys and genre communities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My first experience with um, online stuff, well, uh, kind of like with, with communities and stuff, it started with a, I started doing, independently publishing my own um, little homemade comics and stuff, just black and white, just, you know, scribbling on an A4 bit of paper, and it was just about, I, it was about um, 
who I was working with. So I did a comic book about selling comics. And it was just seriously, it was just, you know, like the, the most budget thing you could ever do. Like a zine that you just made yourself, black and white. And then um, I started to sell them in the shop and they became more popular. And um, someone said to me, you should go in the 24 hour comics challenge. And I'd like, I'm like, what's that? And basically it was an online community, uh, like a, a comic book forum called um, pulpfaction.net, which is like an Australian forum. And I went on there and they've got a competition where you, um, you have to create a 24 page comic in 24 hours and every hour upload a page to the to the competition. And you're not allowed to cheat because they put like every hour they put little bits and pieces that have to be within like, the story so you can't write it beforehand. So um, yeah, I, I did that and went in the competition. It was really fun. And from there, that was my first experience. I was like blown away. Like oh, there was like, you know, like 40, 50 entries into this thing and like I didn't win. <laughs> but um, uh, I, and actually the next year after that, I got banned from it. And the next year after that, I won my category. And I got banned. Why did you get banned? Oh, I just decided that I was going to make a really adult one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and just see if I could get banned. I I could win. And uh, yeah, I totally achieved my goal. And then the next, <laughs> the next year I thought maybe I'll cut it down but still make it heaps adult. Because heaps of people liked it, but then heaps of people hated the one as well. So you so, went in between the two. Yeah, I went in between and I won my category. It was just funny. And um, yeah, I, I, I met a whole lot of people through that. And then they were like, why don't you come to like the comic book conventions around Australia, and I thought, I have no idea what you're talking about. And mm. each city, yeah, like Adelaide has them now, they've got, we've got three, we've got like the uh, Avcon, uh, Anime and Video Games Convention, we've got uh, Oz Comic Con comes here now, and one called Supernova. So these are giant, gigantic pop... One's in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, one's in yeah. a couple of weeks, yeah. Giant pop culture thing, so if you're into comics, if you're into writing, uh, Sean's like, he, he's got a... Uh, a story kind of thing. I don't know what you've got. I mean, I've no idea. You, you were going through the mist towards this place, and the next minute I see Darth Vader yeah. running around, and I thought, what? I've never had that happen because I hadn't been to that kind of convention. So, yeah, they're mm. amazing. Yeah, so that, yeah, that was like the first kind of experience I had, like basically with an online community, and then after that, that pushed me into the actual pop culture community. Which so, one awesome. thing that strikes me. Um, particularly I think it happens in genre communities first, but now we're seeing it with things like Writers Week, is this flow that happens between the author and the reader, that what a convention is often is this meeting place where authors meet their readers. So I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about that, about, and what that's like when you get contact from readers in these kind of environments. Well, one of the things that really struck me about these environments, and somebody once gave me a statistic, which, which I don't know where it came from, they might have made it up, but it seems true to me, that in, in the science fiction and fantasy genres, the boundary between reader and writer is, is incredibly permeable. So that apparently more readers in, in our genre want to become writers and try to become writers than any other genre around. And I don't know whether that's true. Oh, that's interesting. But it is interesting. So when you, when you go to a convention, you meet a bunch of readers, you've got to be aware that three out of every ten, or four out, four out of every ten, may be a published author one day, and may be better than you one day. And uh, so you can't be horrible to them. And not that you'd ever be horrible anyway. <laughs> not that you ever would be, but, uh, but, you, but I think it, it's worth listening to them. And, and one of the things that struck me about, um, um, particularly Perth con science fiction conventions, is that it, we could be on a panel like this, three of us talking. It could be Neil Gaiman, the guy who made Babylon 5, and Joss Whedon sitting at a table. And the people in the audience would get involved in the conversation and start kind of interrupting to add their own kind of opinion. That's to just waited. Well, yeah, yeah well, well, probably, you know, and that's the, I think that's one of the great things about, um, about fandom, that there is this sense that it's a level playing field. Well, I mean, that it you is may a community, be, right? That it that's is a community. Even if they don't know you, and you might even be Joss Whedon, but they still feel that they've got so something you to must, contribute. You and certainly great. must have yeah, encountered that writing Star Wars books. Yeah. That you're yeah, in yeah. this incredibly, like, Star Wars fans, are, they own those stories. Yeah, it's great. It's challenging, but it's great. Do you have any horrible stories about, like, fans? Uh, I've got sad stories. Oh, don't uh, tell them. Sorry? <laughs> don't tell them. I want funny ones. If anyone, yeah, you know, <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. It's funny, it's sad that it's funny. I mean, I get... I get <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because it's sad. <laughs> yeah, I get people sending me um, headshots and saying, I'd love to be a Jedi Knight. Oh, that's and, awesome. Well, you know, that is... And it's, Watch it's, your email address. Yeah. <laughs> well, quite a few of my friends have been name-checked in Star Wars novels, so it's not an unreasonable request, but I, I won't do it for a stranger, usually. But, you know, some, some boy from Iowa sends me a photo and says, you know, I'd like to be a Jedi and idol, but a Sith would be OK, or in fact, anything at all would be brilliant, you know. And, 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 and that kind of level of passion is really amazing, but it's also quite challenging and 
Because you can't say no, you have to pretend you can. But how can you make them a Sith or a, just name? Just throw them, just name them. Oh, yeah, you just say it, you say no. Just names, yes. I'm just trying to think who in this room I might have used as a Sith. <laughs> yeah, quite, oh, uh, yeah, mate, I don't know. <laughs> so, Isabel, what about you when you, I mean, whether it's online or if at a convention, that kind of passion for the for, for fantasy? Well, I find that the, what's my first um, encounter with fandom was really through, um, through a, a fan site that was started maybe 20 years ago or something, and it's a really vigorous, really lively, fantastic fan site which I check to find out details about my own <laughs> books on. They, they, they go through all of my books and they're having this huge project and they're long of, of synopsising every single chapter of every single book. So if I want to figure something out in one chapter, I think, oh, God, I'll just look on that. <laughs> <laughs> and they know better than me what my books are. And so I, I'm, I'm actually a little bit scared of them because they often ask questions I have to look up, which they know the answers to. or they So, so they, they're really, really knowledgeable. So I have great respect for their knowledge of me and, uh, and to see how they have theories boards and they have fan fiction which is so good that I don't read it mm. because after one look I thought, oh my God, I'll be influenced by this in the yeah, storyline or, or I'll have my own idea and it'll mirror someone else's idea and I always feel vaguely guilty about it. So I said this, your fan fiction, I, one, my one look at it, it's just too good. When the Open Newton Chronicles was finished, that's when I'm allowed to look at the fan fiction. And they have long threads of theory. Wanting to play fight me. <laughs> <laughs> and, girls, and girls telling me that they would like, they love me and they want to marry me. That's, that's basically all I get. I was, um... It's not too bad. Yeah. It's pretty it's easy. Are you allowed in school? Okay. Are you allowed in school? <laughs> yeah. You haven't got any so that, that was the high school. Actually, you've got, you've got a funny story, just to backtrack a bit about when you have to tell your publisher about your adult comedy. Because oh. you write for kids. Yeah, they're basically, um... Because, uh, as I said, saying my like, original independent stuff was very adult based. There was lots of like swearing. There was heaps of dicks and stuff in it, and just all sex jokes and toilet humour and violence and stuff like that. And I just when she said, "Can you write?" Because I uh, she asked me to write a, a children's book, and I said, "Oh, maybe I should show you all this." And I like gave it all to my publisher, and she just sat there pissing herself, laughing, and thought it was the funniest thing. So I, I was really worried at first. I thought they'd go like, "Oh, you're gonna." Destroy yourself with like all this stuff, but yeah, it was fine. Um, is that the story you meant? Yeah, I just noticed it was, it's really interesting because you know we start out as beginning authors and you don't necessarily know where you're going to end up. Yeah, you yeah. End up in schools with children. Yeah, so, like, I never because when I was writing that stuff, I never thought I'd ever become a writer or anything like that or, or whatever I'm now. And um, yeah, so I just did whatever I wanted. It didn't matter how horrible or crass it was and stuff. The other day I was working at Pulp Fiction and a, a class of kids went past. And they were just, I just said, Oh my god, it's Dan McGinnis! <laughs> and like, so they're my fans that I get, like, the little kids pointing at me. And then, like, once one points, they all point at you and squeal. And so that's all I get with a teacher trying to move them along. So you know what see? Like, Dan, I don't know, adults we don't tend to, I have little kids, so I know about it. They have, like, badges of Pilot and Huxley on their bags and stuff. Like, it's a big wow. thing. So I was just wondering what it's like. Like, when we go talk at panels, you kind of just, Go with it a bit, but when you go to talk to children, yeah, what do I, you have to do? Be a I would, comic. Yeah, yeah. I, the first time I had to do, I like, talk to. I think the first one I did was like to ninety kids, and it was like all ages, and I didn't know what to do. I was so scared, like because you know kids are the most judgmental people in the oh. entire world, <laughs> and um, <laughs> they'll just tell you if you're like you're crap. stupid. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Why does your breast smell like coffee? <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah, I so I created like. Uh, yeah, I, ha I have to do, what, to talk to kids you really have to do interactive stuff, so now I just draw, um, I talk about creating characters, creating worlds, creating how I write and stuff like that, and then at the end I get like a whiteboard and I'll create a character with them from their ideas in the audience, so I go, let's like make our character an animal, and like, what animal should we use? <laughs> And like try and get them like going creative and stuff, and then like doesn't and uh, this animal. So I draw the head, and they're like, "What sort of arms could you have?" And like, it can be anything. And like, so then you get like a dog with robot arms and a squid body, and then they have to name him. And then like, that, I ask them, well, "Where does he live?" And I draw the house that he lives in. He can live in anything. And, and as it goes on, like it starts off really bland. Like they're like dog, 
And by the end, they're like, a dog with a chainsaw coming out of his face. And stuff like <laughs> that. They re- they start, when they suddenly realise that they don't have to hold back anymore, because they, they often, I reckon, kids are in school are like, oh, you can't do that, it's stupid. When they suddenly realise they're allowed to say whatever they want, um, yeah, and then, and then what world they live in. And then at the end, I'm like, look, you guys created this. This is like your character that you all created. This isn't me, I just drew what you said. And I try and push their... Um, the the job, what? You start off with your own community. Yeah. I mean, when you're a graphic novelist, yeah. you've got people around you all the time. So yeah. It's, it's, so it's, uh, that's great. Less solitary than just being a writer. Yeah, I have no idea what it would be like to just be uh, an actual word writer. Is that the right word? Word, word writer. writer. <laughs> 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 so, what, what's in, so the three of you have come at it on a quite a personal level straight away, which I think... Um, is the way we act as people, like you're not just an author, you're a person, so you approach conventions as a person and all of that. But I know there's a marketing angle mm. and that this is a room full of writers. And how do you market towards general communities? Or I mean, is, does that play a role? Are you consciously doing it or is it just organic? I can tell my World Fantasy convention story. Do it, do it. Which is yeah. that, but I've been nagged by a gut next to go to World Fantasy for a really long time. And uh, I finally went in 2003 in Washington. And uh, this was... I had a real dip in my career. I, I was earning you know, hardly any money at all, and, and half that money that year went to going to this convention and then going on to England to meet some editors. And I went to this convention thinking, well, you know, if I don't get anything out of it, at least I'll meet some new people, which is great. And I did. I met I met a couple of guys in the bar who Ooh. were Doctor Who fans. Yeah, it went down. <laughs> and, and that's as far as it went. We just sort of talked about Doctor Who, our favourite Doctors, our favourite episodes. We did this every night at the convention. <laughs> rah, 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 rah. And I was thinking, I'm actually not meeting anybody important, but I'm having a great time, that's good. So I went back home and uh, um, kept communicating with these people by email. So, uh, And then six months later, then one of them became the commissioning editor for a brand new imprint of a new science fiction line called Kaya. And I emailed Lou Anders and said, Lou, congratulations, that's fantastic. And he said, you got any books that haven't been published in America? And I said, yeah, I have. And I sent him a stack and he ended up publishing six of my books. And then oh, the, up, then the other guy, he started his own publishing line and he emailed me and said, look, you know, I know you're working with Lou and I'm hoping you'll have time to write me a new novella. So I wrote the debut standalone novella in a beautiful bound edition for him as well. So I'd sold seven books just from going to the convention and hanging out. With some dudes. In the bar with some dudes, you know? <laughs> and I, and I'm, wow. I probably hung up with lots of other people that I didn't make any money from, but, but I didn't meet those guys because they were a you know anybody or that I was thinking I could sell anything but just by kind of putting myself out there yeah uh, you know and that's many sense like, if you'd been mean to them because they weren't anyone like you're saying yeah. before you would have got nothing out of that well again in London I mean I went through London and I had all these meetings with editors lined up but there was a, an Australian guy who had just got sacked from his job uh, as a commissioning editor for a publishing line and I emailed him and said look um, do you want to meet for lunch and he said why I'm not anybody now I'm not running I can't you can't sell anything to me. And I said, that's right, you're an Australian, I've got a free day, it'll be great to catch up, we've never met before. Two weeks later, he took up a whole new line and, um, and, and bought my next space opera series for an absolutely huge amount of money. So again, if I hadn't had lunch with this guy who was a nobody, you know, nobody, uh, then this wouldn't have happened. And I think that's the great thing that can come out of community, I think. Yeah. And, and but, but, so you're, but you're suggesting that it has to be a genuine open thing because you know you go to conventions uh, yeah. and there are people who are quite mercilessly networking like, some people are good at that i'm terrible at that so, i don't even know what i went and i didn't know what i was supposed to do i was just intimidated by all these people all of whom i thought were probably really famous and i was too stupid to know it and i just wandered around like a lost sheep thinking what am i doing i should be just home writing a book this is the stupidest thing i've ever done and I also got in some great conversations. Nothing came out of any of them except I'm still in contact with some of them. And I, I did have a good time when I stopped thinking I should be doing something, mm. only I didn't know what that something was. And if I had to go and sell myself to someone, I was crippled with embarrassment at the thought of it. So I, I wouldn't have been capable of it anyway. So I did have a good time. And if anything came out of it, it would be that idiosyncratic. And people who mercilessly sell themselves are unbelievably boring and I don't want to talk to them. So it, it, I think they must have that effect on everybody. Merciless. If that's the only reason you're talking what to someone, it's horrible. Well, what do you mean selling yourself? Well, I mean, if all they're doing is telling you about their books, and oh, there's no see. sense of interaction. If a person doesn't mm. ask a single question, including what your name is, and they're blabbering at you about their books, there's no... It has to be sort of like you want to have an actual conversation. Mm. 
And if they say something, you want to respond to it, and they don't give you room even to respond. They're just busy telling you... Wait for their turn to speak. Yeah, well, there's no turn. That's their (laughs) turn, and that's it. And that's horrible, you know? And I think, does anyone like that ever sell anything? Well, I think they do. I think some people people are good at it. Like, Fiona McIntosh was at that same world fantasy. It was was both our first world fantasy. Um, I don't do anything as a marketing strategy. I, I was asked, do I want to go on Facebook? And I said, no. And then after a while, my daughter wanted me to go on Facebook and she was too young. So I said, all right, well, we'll both go on, but I have to have your password so I can check no weirdos Facebook in here. (laughs) So I was on and we started by just posting stuff back to one another from one room to the other. And then we we wanted to have a third person, so we made my partner go on as well. And, and so we made him up a Facebook thing, which he now uses like crazy. But back then we were just using it. And he said he just didn't want to. And then people he knew kept friending him, even though it was us putting it up there. So it was for a while we were just doing it. And it was funny when some stranger would come on. But little by little, more and more people join. And I, I never ask anybody to join. And when anyone comes and wants to join me, all I do is look at their friend list. And if their white supremacist society is their friend list, I don't friend them. But other than that, I friend them. And all I do with my Facebook, I don't market anything. All I do is I, I really love photos. So I hunt all over Facebook for photos. And I pull 13 of them onto my Facebook every single night when I'm home. And people come on and like them. And I have hundreds and hundreds of people come on just to look at the photos. And I had someone come on the other day and say, I heard you write books as well. So that's how, <laughs> that's how big a marketer I am. So I'm photos. not a marketer yeah. at all. But, but if, I have a, if I have an event that's happening, I just say, I'm going to be here if anyone would like to come. And so people can come if they want. And that's all. And I don't care what the publishers say. I'm embarrassed to do anything else and that's, even though I'm told constantly, at least tweet it twice, at least put it on twice. So once and that's it. So you you don't do guest blogs or blog or? Again, I was asked to do a blog and I said no because when would you fit the time in? But I was was paid to do one for a month and I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting format. So then I decided, I thought for another few months about what I would do, what I could manage to do time-wise. So now I I have a, a blog called The Slipstream and I post an essay on it once a fortnight, and the essay is about anything I want. It's never anything to do with publishing or books. It's to do with just whatever. I wrote an essay called On Silence, discussion, which I might not even enter into. I just find it interesting. Or I might make one comment. I love about social media that I don't have to begin and end conversations. I can just walk away at any minute. If I'm working, I can say, oh, that's funny, make one comment or like it once. No waste of time, and I'm back to my own life. So. Mm. Okay, Sean, how about you? I very well. You're always on. Sorry, you're always on Facebook. Well, I'm always on Facebook. I tend to, I tend to, because I'm very, very lazy. I tend to do only things that I feel really passionate about, and I've got kind of a, a list of priorities. And number one is always writing fiction. Uh, number two is meeting people when I'm out and about. I really like meeting people. And number three is kind of social media. And I do social media when I'm not doing the other two. So, so I'm really bad at. I mean, I, I could have taken a photo half an hour ago and said, I'm about to go on stage with Dan and Andy and, and, and you know, isn't it fantastic? I could have done that, but I didn't even think of it because I was talking to other people. So I, mm. when I need to, when I, when, when I see a lot of other people being really good at social media, it does, it's not even occurring to me. When I, when I engage with social media is, is, is when I'm at home and I'm a little bit bored and I'm feeling a little bit lonely and I've discovered a great picture of Brussels sprouts, which I been, think is really fantastic <laughs> and I'll post it. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, or something else cool that's happened. And I, I, sometimes I think, you know, I really should tweet that and I will kind of always die a little bit inside yeah, and don't too. do it. Yeah. And, I, and so, so I'm really, really unprofessional. But I do like popping up. I'm, I'm always on Facebook. I find that really friendly because you can get a conversation going and I, I'm still working out how Twitter works in terms of conversations and, and I, I feel like I have to be on Twitter longer to have a conversation than I do with Facebook So and Facebook has pretty pictures. So. I think Twitter is cyber signposting not conversation. Yeah. It's like how you find out where to go and look at something or to set up something with someone. Like it's, not, it somewhere else. it's not good with a conversation because you have to do it in that really short Piece of you have to be very quippy too, and I'm not naturally quippy. That's good, quippy. I like that. I like I, being coarse to do that. Quippy. Yeah, quippy. Yeah, quippy. And does social media really well. Yeah. And I think it's quite, I mean. So, like a brand or something like that, they have to see, like, say, like, my eyes and my brand seven times before the next time, on the eighth time, they'll see it and go, that's that brand that I know. So, you need to get your stuff pushed into their faces as much. And I just. Damn, I should have tweeted seven <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in writing. 
and it lives in South Australia or Australia or America or something like that, and it will put your ad on the side of their column going, and you write your little ad. It's only a little thing, almost like a, a tweet kind of thing. So what do you add? What's your ad? Well, basically, it'll be a little picture on the side, and it'll be even a like button there, so you can look, and it'll be linked to your profile page. Oh, your that's where from. Yeah. So basically, uh, and that, you, you'll notice it. Like, you'll always be getting, like, by the end of the two weeks, like, you'll have, like, another 800 people that have liked your thing. And they're purely liking it because they want to like it, because they've seen it, and they're like, look at this, this is something I want to like. And that's, and then from there, you start, you start posting to these people about stuff. And as I said, you don't want to just... Put like you know, um, look at this cake I'm eating. Yeah. Look at this cake that I just ate. Look at the plate <laughs> and stuff like that. You want some Brussels sprouts? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> something strange. But um, so that so then I find the stuff I put up is the stuff that I feel is important to me. Like if I go, if something, if I go, oh, I got a new book deal or I or something like that, oh, I've started my new book. I put up like, and you always kind of have to have a picture with it. You just put writing out, people will just flick through it, but most people will just go down and go, oh, what's that picture? I say, hey, hey, you're winning. Because yeah. <laughs> it's always an animal. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I find the cat, few cat pictures. I try to restrain myself to one cat picture a day. Yeah, so basically, I'll put up, like, something that I feel is important to me, I'll put a picture with it that involves it, like, say, I, I went to a school. Um, and the kids made paper mache figures out of my characters from my book, and I'll take a photo of that, and I find that cute. And most people find that cute. So, yeah. and you put stuff up like that. From there, um, but you also, as much as you can, you put like your website, so that links back to there, and also your Twitter. So anything you put on Twitter, if you want, can also link to your website. These, these things all work together. So you only have to put it on one thing. You go do, 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 across all all mm. the platforms, stuff like that. That this Facebook is like saying they have changed their. Um, the algorithms lately, so because well, Facebook's just been sold on to like uh, as a um, you know, where people put shares in and stuff like that. I don't know what that's called. What's it's called? become like a company. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, the big companies the now who own a lot of the stock in there have gone like, hang on, it's not fair that our corporation gets the same amount of coverage as these people. So they've pushed to change the algorithms. The smaller the company is, like, so. If you've got like say a thousand people, it will only go uh, say a thousand people like you. It will only go up to a, a percentage of those people. Everything you post now, and that's purely the corporation. Facebook may implode on itself because of this, but there will always be something after that the same. Like there'll be something like Google Plus, um, other things that they'll create in the future. There'll always be a social media network thing forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah from now on, and it's something you have to have. I feel, yeah. and and um, that's is if you want to push yourself a bit more. I get lots of uh, and great blood. Like, constantly, I, I have people telling me that I'm good, which is what you need as a writer. Like, yeah, like so you have like, uh, and, and it's amazing, like, the, the reach that Facebook's got, man. Like, I have like teachers in Idaho, yeah. just, and you like can't think of <laughs> me to get that off the internet time as well. A bit awkward. But <laughs> what you're suggesting too is that it's very separate though. Like, so writing still be it's very genuine. It is, yes. Yeah. Like, it is much more savvy than me on the app. How do you do the game? <laughs> um, and I think the younger writers, I think that they are much more savvy and they're going to figure out ways that we can, we can well, learn from. Um, you know, rather than. Yeah. But it's still genuine and that's maybe the difference between someone who's doing it badly and someone who's doing it well. Yeah, well what I was going to say is you keep your personal life separate. You definitely have it's your like, own personal Facebook profile. That I keep. I have one out there that doesn't have my real name. It, I keep it completely private. Everything to private, 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 private. No one can see anything unless they're my friends. Then you, from that profile, you create your fan page of yourself. So, because you have to have a profile, never use your original profile. Always do a fan page of it of yourself, and that's the one that you market yourself to people. Um, you, you'll be able to see if you go to like Facebook and you um, any page that you go to, there'll be a link down the bottom that says create a page like this. So if you go to your author, favourite author or whatever on Facebook and their one, just go down the bottom and it'll have like create fan page and like, and that will create it from your thing. So I, I suggest have a very personal life and have a completely open life. Because like you don't want to post up, you know, like because people can post stuff to your wall. You don't want your friends posting up, you know, your picture of you with a lampshade on your head drunk at a party on your kid's author page or something like that. <laughs> that doesn't like, go very well. So yeah, yeah, you always have your two separate internet lives. Keep one very private, keep one completely open and just keep, uh, yeah, always have like, yeah. That, your private one will be the one where you talk about Brussels sprouts and cakes and stuff like that. 
No, no, no. You see, I have my public. Oh, have you got that? You know, my, my, my main Facebook site is my private. Yeah, my so you don't you know, have a I do have a page, page, and I've got like 200 people on that one because well, I mainly people. talk about Brussels sprouts, uh, and the main one people enjoy that. So. And other people set up fan pages, so there's like a whole bunch of fan pages yeah. I have set up. But yeah. I just like just having sense. the two worlds, like, put, like pulled apart, like... It's probably like nothing to little kids, I think. Yeah, yeah. maybe it is because I'm, I have to do young it's kids and I don't want to swear. Like, you know, people put up swearing and stuff. And yeah. it, uh, I also... Um, ...what kind of fit person you are. And I think people would be... Well, there are sick creepos out there, but generally if you're going on your page and you see that little children are going on it, what kind of person... Pup? They do, of course, but mostly I think that people don't. It's always hilarious. Most of my yeah people on fans on Facebook are like eight year old kids, and you probably have to be like sixteen to have a Facebook account. And then, <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I give it? I mean, doing. Yeah. Everyone yeah. will say that you have to do it. You have to do. It. You don't actually have to do it. Your your first responsibility is to do whatever it is that you want to do right. to the best of your ability to write. <laughs> yeah, and this is something that Garth Nix always says. I mean, Garth Nix, he, I mean, he's a huge success before social media was around, and continues to be a huge success even though he doesn't pop up very often. And, and he sort of says, look, if I can be a success without doing social media, then so can anybody in this room if they want. Mm. But, it, but it, it is still a good thing to do if you enjoy it, if you can find a way to do it. He would have started it. writing before social media existed. And that's, that's right. like the main thing. You remember the young people these days have never not known it. That's yeah. right. So if, to not do it to them, it's just like, wait, why can't I find his page? Yeah. But he mustn't really exist or something like that. Yeah. You don't exist on the internet. You don't you exist don't in exist. people's minds anymore. Right? Well, as long as other people are talking about you on the internet, that's okay. But, but if, you, if, if, and if that can happen to you without actually you doing it, then that's brilliant, you'll be okay. But it doesn't usually happen that way. You usually have to kind of be the person who lights the views and sees mm. the flame going. So you have to be very lucky to get away with it. But, but it's not impossible. And if you really hate it, people will be able to tell, I think. Uh, <laughs> Same with, same with going to conventions. If you really hate being around other people and you're not very good at it, people can tell and won't want to talk to you and will think less of you. Um, yeah, you. So, so you damage I've yourself. I've seen dudes burn their bridges ones. at conventions, man. <laughs> There's another Sean. I won't give you his surname, <laughs> but uh, people often think that I'm him. And, uh, and he... he he has such a bad reputation that it started to affect my reputation. So I actually got a rejection once from an editor in England saying, based on Sean's performance at Worldcon in Scotland two weeks ago, we won't be looking at any more of Sean's books. And, I, and my agent passed on to me to say, what the hell did you do? And I came back saying, it wasn't me, I wasn't in Scotland, it was the other Sean. So that went back to the editor. So, 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 and that person arguably shouldn't be going to conventions, you know, because he's hurting himself and he's hurting me. So, <laughs> yeah, I think he's right. You don't... You don't have to do social media, but it's a tool that if you want to use it, you can use it massively to your advantage. Like right. If you want to, I mean, you don't have to put heaps of time in, but if you can, if you can play, if you can use that tool, yeah, create something amazing with and it. And find what it is for you, like with that blog thing. For a long time, I didn't want to blog, but once I started doing it, I had to find out how I could be within that form and what worked for me. And you can do that too. You can find what works for you and what you like doing and what you're comfortable, how much time you're prepared to put in and do it yourself. I suppose in my background, it's been more, or my experience,